That was exciting. It sure was. Um, superintendent's report when Dr. Ross gets his seat, and we'll turn this over to you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, members of our community, I uh, want to thank you so much and uh, certainly honored by those school board spotlights and many things that are going on within our school district that we are so proud of. Uh, at this time, before the winter holidays, I'd like uh, to give an update. We're still not out of this uh, notion of uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, and so we've heard a lot about a new variant and uh, things that are going on in our community. I want to ask our Director of Accountability, uh, Director Van Holden, to come forward, give us a COVID-19 update, COVID-19 dashboard update. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Uh, what we have seen in recent weeks um, is a slight uptick in the number of COVID impacted students and staff in the district. Um, we are currently at our highest number of COVID impacted students since the beginning of October. Uh, that has tended to mirror what we've seen in the community where we had a steady decline in the two week incidence rate um, uh, over several weeks. Uh, what we've seen in recent weeks is the two week incident rate has uh, picked back up um, primarily in uh, Lexington County, but also slightly in Richland County as well. Uh, what that uh, increase in the two week incident rate did was it brought uh, Lexington County's DHEC county risk level uh, back up to high. Uh, Richland County is currently at medium and uh, due to that, that's the reason our schools are currently operating at a mitigation level of orange. Uh, but here on the graph, you can see, uh, we just tried to assist folks in understanding um, what one of the key measures is that's driving that, uh, driving that decision and is leading us um, to that piece. But again, what we're seeing uh, is that we are seeing a, a slight increase in the number of COVID impacted students, but that has tended to follow uh, historically over the last uh, several months of this that when we see uh, increases in, in the community, we tend to see those uh, mirrored here in our schools as well. And that's the, the trend that's um, currently happening with our COVID numbers and with our COVID dashboard. Are any questions? Any questions? All right, at this time, we would like to move forward as uh, we pro uh, provided to you uh, the strategic plan. Uh, Van Holden and uh, his team uh, through Dr. Harris's office has been preparing the strategic plan, uh, which we bring uh, kind of our third presentation to the board for approval. This approval will allow schools to move forward uh, with uh, their, their detailed strategy. So we we'll like a, a brief over, uh, kind of overview of this. Uh, so Director Holden, can you take us through this? Absolutely. Uh, so several months ago, dating back to last school year, we began our work on our new five-year plan. Uh, we've involved several uh, stakeholders, uh, parents, teachers, students, uh, support staff, um, community members throughout that process, administrators. And what we have for you tonight is kind of a quick summary of the information that we have presented at this point. Uh, there is no new information in this, um, although there's one wording change um, on one of the slides, which I'll point out when we get to that. Uh, but we have uh, the same goals that we've presented uh, the last few times. In the area of school climate, we have a goal for parent, student, and teacher satisfaction with the social and physical environment. Uh, with the school climate piece, we also have uh, designated strategies that are intended to support the district as we work towards those goals. Uh, those include partnering and engaging with our families, uh, the social and emotional development of our students, uh, school-wide expectations, bullying, prevention, and intervention programs, uh, school safety procedures, and uh, progress towards our facilities and physical environment in the, in the schools. Uh, the student achievement section uh, focuses on a few different measures. Uh, we have a growth measure that's associated with our MAP growth test. We have our graduation rate and our college or career readiness. With the student achievement section, we have several strategies as well. Uh, one deals with the college or career readiness of all students the college or career readiness and academic development of our multilingual learners. That is the verbiage change that's occurred uh, in the strategy slide. It's uh, just multilingual learners there instead of it said multi-language learners before. Uh, we have the same uh, strategy, but targeting our students with disabilities on uh, bullet number three there. Uh, we have uh, career readiness and our uh, career and technical education curricula and opportunities. Uh, we have our adult learners and adult education programs. Uh, with uh, bullet number five, and then we have our magnet and choice offerings at number six. In the area of teacher administrator quality, the goals focus on retention rate, teacher satisfaction with working conditions, and teacher satisfaction with relevant professional development opportunities at their school. 
The strategies associated with that are fall under a couple broad areas. One is uh, recruitment and one is retention, uh, but specifically looking to address um, and ensure uh, that uh, the teachers and staff we have in this district that we're making outreach efforts and retention efforts to ensure that the uh, folks in our classrooms are representative of the communities that we currently serve in our district. We also have a strategy on alternative certification and supporting teachers going through that process, as well as the professional development programs here in the district and an emphasis on our choice offerings. For our gifted and talented goal, uh, we actually have one that focuses on, or two that focus on the outcomes, which are the growth measure, again with map growth, as well as the advanced placement uh, passage rate. And the final goal there uh, relates to our work to uh, ensure that uh, all students are afforded uh, the opportunity to participate in AGP honors, AP, IB, or dual enrollment courses um, at similar rates across all grade levels that those programs are offered. The first set of gifted and talented strategies uh, works to ensure the, uh, the, the curriculum is appropriate and targeted towards the needs of the students who are in those classes. And then we also have several strategies in place to ensure that students who are taking those courses for the first time or students who have not had that opportunity to participate in those courses that we're making appropriate efforts to uh, enrich the learning experiences of those students and support them as they progress through those courses uh, so they can be successful um, in those, in those uh, AGP honors, AP and IB courses. Um, currently, uh, district administrators uh, are working on action steps associated with those strategies. Uh, those should be in draft form this week. Our schools are also working uh, with their stakeholders to finalize their goals, their strategies, and their action plans. We anticipate if everything goes uh, smoothly with that process, we'll be done with that phase by January 31st. Again, that's pending uh, your review of this information as well, uh, but we have uh, begun to work uh, through some of these pieces because they are um, uh, somewhat time intensive and we wanted to make sure we were at least uh, beginning that work of determining the action steps, timelines, persons responsible, estimated costs as part of this process. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ross. Thank you. Any questions uh, regarding the strategic plan? Dr. Ross, when um, we flew through those uh, numbers real quick, those increases from, I saw one of them was um, from 49 to 59%, and that would be from uh, year 2021 to 2026, I believe. Um, how, were those, how were those arrived at? What, what, what's the, static, the statistician's comments on that? Are you referring to the one, the 49%? Uh, well, I'm just, you know, you had on the um, the bottom level there, just the one that you had on there just previously, previously yes. So anyway. um, that really started gifting town and strategy. So with many of the strat or many of the goals that we looked at, we looked at how other districts across the state were performing, and we looked at where we were performing according to specific measures. And we said, okay, so if we want to move to the top 10 percent or top 5 percent on a specific measure, here's how we would get there. Here's how here's the amount of growth we'd expect. On that measure, uh, there is no comparable statewide data. Uh, so what we looked at there was the um, disproportionate um, participation in AGP, uh, honors, AP, IB, and dual enrollment courses. And what we said was uh, across a five-year period, uh, what would be an appropriate gain there, uh, we looked at 10%. There is no exact science to determining how we're going to get to that 10% or if 10% is the appropriate measure. What we know that is if we increase by 10%, we've at least made substantial strides in, in closing uh, the, the uh, disparity there in terms of participation in those programs. That will not uh, correct the full uh, disparity in terms of participation, but at least puts the district on the track to address that, um, that gap that has existed, that participation gap. Mr. Lovis, that's good? Yeah, yes. Okay. Any Thank other you. questions on the strategic plan? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you so much. Thank right. you. Thank you, Mr. Holden. At this time, we'll have our money uh, monthly financial report uh, by our CFO, Marty Rawls. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ross, I was about to say Dr. James, I'm in the wrong place. Um, you will first see the monthly revenue summary for the end of October 2021. And as you can see from that summary, um, we are trending very similarly as we did last year. At this time, it's um, minimal differences between the two years. Are there any questions regarding the revenue summary? Any questions? Okay. 
and the expenditure summary. Scroll up just a little bit more for me, John. The other way, sorry. This is the expenditures as of the end of October. Um, one thing I wanted to bring to note, there's about a percent difference between where we are this year and where we were last year. Um, the teacher steps had not taken effect last year at this time, so you will constantly see a little bit higher percentage of expenditure this year because the teacher step was um, started at the beginning of the school year versus uh, happening retro in the school year. So that we're gonna notice all school year, there'll be a little bit of variance in this year as compared to last year. Any questions on expenditures? Any questions? Oh, I, I do have one question. Um, so for most of the expenses, we're a third of the, this is a third of the school, right? Third. It is, but remember with school not starting until August, that kind of skews those numbers a little bit. Right. So I guess I was concerned like on something like supplies and materials, those are the front end, more of those are front end loaded, right, in August? So it's not concerning that we're at 39% when we're only at 33% of the year. You'll see expenditures a little bit higher at the beginning of the year than at the end of the year. And um, you know, when we look at the budget amendment, that will put additional funding into that line item because we, we funded them at such a lower percentage mm -hmm. than a full year's worth. So once the amendment um, is reviewed and, and we get to where we are able to process that, that'll put more money in those line items. Any other questions? All right. All right. At this time, uh, we'll handle the 2020-2021 uh, financial audit report. Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Ross, thank you very much for your time this evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Hodges. I'm a CPA and audit partner with Burkett, Burkett, and Burkett CPAs in West Columbia. Uh, tonight, I will provide our required audit communications, present a summary of the financial statements, and address any comments uh, or questions that you may have regarding our fiscal year 2021 financial audit. Uh, first, on the required audit communications, uh, the school district is responsible for the pre preparation of the financial statements. Uh, design, implementation, and maintenance of internal controls over financial reporting and on compliance, and lastly on compliance with laws, regulations, contracts, and grant agreements. Our firm is responsible for performing our audits in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards, government auditing standards, and the uniform guidance. We tested the district's activities based upon our knowledge uh, of the district. We use professional judgment in selecting uh, sample sizes that we determined uh, were reasonable um, for testing the district's activities. Uh, those are not designed to provide absolute or 100% assurance on the district's activities. Uh, but in doing so, we did not note any instances of noncompliance with district policy. We have issued three clean opinions. First, an unmodified opinion on the financial statements themselves. Secondly, uh, we did not identify any deficiencies in internal controls over financial reporting that we consider to be material to the financial statements. And lastly, an unmodified opinion in regards to compliance with the major federal award program, and that was the Child Nutrition Cluster, or Food Service, for fiscal year 2021, which had over $8.6 million in expenditures. Uh, there were no changes in accounting policies for fiscal year 2021 uh, in the note disclosures. Uh, there was one reporting change, which the district was required to make and did make, um, as a result of a change in generally accepted accounting principles uh, that required the student activity funds to be reclassified. In prior years, those have been treated as fiduciary activities. Uh, for this year, that has been changed to a special revenue fund. So if you're comparing the current year report to prior years, you'll notice there are some schedules that were required in prior years when this was presented as a fiduciary activity uh, that are no longer, excuse me, required. And these are, uh, again, included in your special revenue funds. Uh, one other item, it's not on my slide, but I did want to mention 
um, that uh, in regards to just looking forward uh, to next year, there is a change um, in governmental accounting standards that will affect the district. It's GASB 87 uh, that has to do with leases. Uh, again, that will be effective for the year into June 30th, 2022. Uh, that's mainly uh, potentially a change on the government-wide financial statements and note disclosures. Pleased to report we didn't have any disagreements with management in performing our audit. Not aware of any consultations with any other independent accountants uh, relating to the financial audit. There were no issues that were discussed prior to our retention as your independent auditors. And uh, again, pleased to report we had no significant difficulties in, in performing the audit. We did receive full cooperation um, from your staff. And uh, certainly want to express our thanks to Marty Rawls, Connie Frick, Leanne London, and all of the employees in the finance office as well as the district uh, because it certainly involves uh, a number of folks to get the report together that you have tonight. Looking at the financial statements, the general fund balance increased by $4.7 million in fiscal year 2021. In comparing general fund revenues for fiscal 21 to prior fiscal years, or the, the prior fiscal year, excuse me, uh, there was an increase in general fund revenues of $1.8 million. Of that, $1.2 million was in additional local property taxes. I believe that was in uh, response to a reassessment of property in 2020. And general fund expenditures increased by $5.8 million, again, compared to fiscal year 2020. Uh, of that, $5 million was in instructional and support salary increases, and that did include uh, bonuses that the district issued, about $2.6 million. And there were also increases in insurance uh, premiums and retirement benefits. The general fund balance itself was $51.2 million as of June 30th, 2021. Non-spendable items were just under $5 million, and that represents largely prepaid items uh, in the general fund. Assigned fund balance was just under $11 million, and you can see the breakdown there. About $1.3 million was assigned uh, for Piney Woods Elementary. $3 million uh, for a one-time employee appreciation gift, $3 million for uh, $50 Fridays for permanent staff, as well as $3.5 million for potential future capital needs. And that leaves about $35.5 million for unassigned fund balance. As of June 30th, that amount represents 18% of the fiscal year 2021 general fund budget. Uh, that amount is uh, within the district policy that requires approximately 15 to 18 percent of the general fund budget to be held in fund balance. And just as a point of comparison, the GFOA recommends a minimum of 16.7 percent of uh, fund balance to be in that unassigned general fund balance. Uh, that's about two months worth of expenditures. Um, also, it's, again, not on the slide, but just as a point of comparison, the South Carolina Department of Education requires half that amount, one month or about 8.3 uh, percent. So. Y'all are in good standing there. Overall, the total governmental fund balances were about $87.2 million as of June 30th. Again, just one uh, other item to note, as I mentioned the property taxes earlier, there was about a 6.4 increase in a combined assessed value for tax year 2020 compared to 2019. And uh, just wanted to mention as well, this is the district's 18th consecutive year uh, of receiving both the GFOA and ASBO Certificates of Excellence in Financial Reporting. Um, the district is certainly to be commended for receiving these rewards on a regular basis. And all, again, as I mentioned, all the hard work that goes into putting these reports together. Um, and, you know, I see no reason why the district won't be receiving these awards for the 19th consecutive year next year. So with that, I'll be happy to address any questions or comments you may have uh, regarding our fiscal year 2021 audit. Ms. Huddle. Um, could you go back to slide 10? Sure. Let's see. I'm going to find that on my... Let's see. That's it. That's it? Okay. Um, so this is the general fund balance. So I was just kind of curious, why is there $1.3 million for Piney Woods? Ms. Huddle, those are the remaining setup funds that have been assigned the previous year. We had a $2 million assignment 
in the 1920 school year and there were some over the summer there were additional items that had not been received that were using those funds and so the board approved continuing that assignment at the June 14th meeting when the general fund budget was approved. Okay, so they're not capital expend expenses. No, ma'am. Okay. They're supplies, library books, and things of that nature that had not all been received as of June 30th of last year. Okay. I have another question, but I'll let somebody okay. else go. Any other question before Ms. Huddle? Okay. Go ahead. Um, I was curious, <clears throat> um, when you guys, um, do you, uh, when you're um, auditing the balance sheet and you're looking at cash assets, do you... Um, balance to our um, checking accounts you do okay. so there's uh, we receive the bank reconciliation reports okay. um, for those who aren't in the accounting world and maybe not be familiar uh, bank reconciliation takes your ending bank balances uh, which we confirm those balances and reconcile those to the balances for the financial statements for outstanding checks and deposits in transit thank you this is uh, probably uh, accounting 101 in governmentals but I noticed that the total revenues were $281 million, okay, but, you know, our budget, our budget is only $201 million. And I was wondering, what is that constituted by, by expenditures for food through the federal government, or, or what, what constitutes the other $80 million? So the $281 million, that's the total governmental fund revenues, um, and that includes... 113 of property tax revenue, and your question was on, was it budget Well, I'm just saying or? that we budget $201 million, okay. yet, yet we've got total receipt revenues of $281 million. I yes. just wonder what makes up the difference in the other $80 million. It's Absolutely. So the budgeted revenues are in regards to the general fund. Um, the general fund total revenues for fiscal year 2021 were $195 million, uh, give or take. Um, there's also included in the amount that you mentioned about $42.5 million of debt service revenues. Those also come from property taxes, but they're not included in the general fund budget. They're under the debt service fund. Um, and there's also, as you mentioned, uh, federal grant revenues and uh, other state revenues that are under different funds. Um, so the overall uh, revenues include revenues from other funds. The biggest piece of that is going to be in the debt service, as I mentioned, but certainly special revenues would be a large part of that as well. If, if you borrow money from one fund to the other, in other words, if you have a capital fund and you have a, a uh, operating fund and you had to borrow money from one to the other, we haven't had to do that. I'm just wondering. No. Do you make, does that, is that footnoted in the, in the financial statement and does it, does it tell you, um, you know, what your total indebtedness would be, you know, imputed interest and that kind of thing if you borrow from one fund to the other? Uh, there's not imputed interest, but there is a note disclosure, which I'm trying to, to find which note that is, but it is in note 10. It's on page 70 of the report, and it's called interfund transactions, and that shows both the transfers in and out. So if you want to look at just current year, what's moved from one fund to the other, you can see that and the reasons why. Uh, there is also the receivables and payables. Um, I will say that the payables are on the general fund side and the receivables are on basically all of the other funds. Um, and so that would be uh, for different reasons. There's indirect costs and matches and things like that where you have to move funds or because we have a, a bank balance uh, that's accounted for in the general fund, but you've uh, got activities in other funds. So you have to, you have to show it that way. Okay, thank you. Sure wanted to mention also, um, we had said we would have printed copies for everyone tonight. We've had a couple, a little snafu with that, but we will have those available for you soon. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody? Oh, Dr. Ross, seeing none. Thank you so much. We Thank you very much it. for your time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hodges. At this time, uh, we'd like to uh, conclude or end the uh, superintendent's report by just kind of going over uh, some of the things that have come to our attention at the, uh, in, the le in the recent weeks, uh, spe specifically as we talk about COVID and providing a safe in-person learning environment for our, our children, um, we know that nationally some of the things that are happening in school are impacting us locally, uh, particularly what happened in Oxford, Michigan, and our, our school sh in the school shootings. And uh, as we, we think about uh, uh, not only that case, but 
since 2021, there has been, as we, as we conclude this year, 33 school shootings in this country, just in this year. And uh, it begs the question, what can we do locally? What can we do here to make sure that when our students uh, come to school, um, yes, we wor worry about a pandemic, but how do we make sure that they're at a safe uh, learning environment? And uh, as I start to look at the data around uh, the school shootings, I find two things. One, it's just not someone um, more or less that comes from outside of the school. It is someone that's actually in the school. It's someone who was assigned to attend the school. The average age of the school shooter in this country is 16. And that uh, begs the question, what is going on with our children? When we talk about bullying and bullies, we're talking about our children. When we talk about students that we're scared of uh, bringing a gun to school, we're talking about our, our children. And we don't have uh, bullying and intimidating and we don't have that in our curriculum. And so while we as schools take on the charge to help our children, I have the question, where do they learn this? Where is this information learned? I saw very unfortunately uh, one of our, our own students under the guise that this student was a threat to the school become isolated, become uh, pulled away from her school. Uh, under the guise that uh, she was a threat. And so I just wanted to make it very clear, Madam Chair, members of the board, members of the community, what we do each and every day to make sure that we have a safe in-person learning environment for all students. As uh, Director Holden talked about our goals, he started off with the school climate goal. And we would need the help of the support community, Madam Chair, members of the board, with a community climate goal. Because what I witnessed on social media, it's bad enough when adults demonstrate bullying in social media. It's bad enough when adults showcase bullying on, on TV and in public forum. When they bring kids into it, when kids are not safe from even the adults in our community from bullying, I think we need a community climate goal. I grew up in a place when, when adults had issues, they did not put that in front of the kids. There was a protection because there was a community climate goal. The kids are not exposed to this level of issue. There is, according to the FBI, there is not the one archetype of a school shooter. But what we do find in the majority of the cases is that they're going through depression, anxiety, suicide ideation, and they're withdrawn, they're isolated. What happened to one of our own students through social media is that this student was isolated by our own community. This student who looked at school as her only place of security uh, because of her home situation or lack thereof and was, that was taken away from her. Uh, this student uh, is struggling to be with us now. So I think as we talk about bullying and what we need to do on the inside, and we have a long way to work in our schools to address it, but we started with a vision of we are schools and community. And I think we have to think about where do we learn these behaviors? Where do our students see these behaviors? Handling differences and diff disagreements is what we really need to be teaching. Do we handle it through yelling and screaming and arguing and hating? Or do we handle it through understanding and love and kindness? What do they see on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter? What do they see in public forums and TV? Where can we go in School District 5 where our children can see people disagree and love? 
because we're neighbors. We don't love the neighbor that agrees with us. We love our neighbors because they're our neighbors. And so as we look for a community climate goal, we as a school will continue to work on our school climate goal, on the things that we can do as School District 5 of Lexington and Richland counties. Our number one defense is prevention. There are not enough metal detectors, there are not enough uh, um, administrators, suspensions, expulsions to get us out of this situation. The best thing that we can do to prevent what happened in Oxford and, and 33 other places like that in this year is to identify the isolated student, the withdrawn student, and get them help. We do that in District 5 anonymously. You do not have to work uh, or walk up to a counselor or even a teacher. We simply ask you to download the Stop It app. Daily, it is monitored, 24-7 it is monitored. And uh, we have addressed students who were at the brink of suicide. We have found students who were bringing weapons to school. We have prevented fights from happening. We have a long way to go. We're, we're not where we want to be yet. But it is our first uh, way of identifying those students that need help. Every student who is considered a threat, or any kind of threat, every student uh, goes through a threat assessment. We're very fortunate to have a national leader, Melissa Reeves, who deals with threat assessments in our uh, uh, training our threat assessment team. Every school in School District 5 has this team that does these threat assessments, which includes searches, to ensure that any student who is considered um, in jeopardy gets that prevention, gets that love. We don't take it seriously when someone brings a weapon to school. I mean, we don't take it lightly when somebody brings a weapon to school. We take it very serious but we're also trying to provide that student a recovery and a way out. The average school shooter is 16. It bothers me because these are our children. I asked at the beginning of the year, how are the children, or if they're in a community and they're in a situation of toxicity, and I think it's us on the adults, to bring a, a better form of examples of how to conduct ourselves when there are disagreements so they can be models. That's the best way to learn, through modeling the behavior. So what are the conditions that we can do to help and to heal? We need to support our teachers as they, and we see nationally, behavioral issues, that toxicity that our students are sitting in, that isolation that they have been in for the last 18, 19 months. We need to support our classrooms to be able to address that. Just as we did with the COVID mitigations, we are uh, piloting uh, a support program where green are the students who do exactly what they're supposed to do. They need very little behavioral interventions. Yellow are those students, when the teacher intervenes, they get right back on track. We have behavioral specialists. We have instructional uh, coaches that help these teachers get those right interventions in. But more and more, Madam Chair, we're seeing, uh, members of the board, we're seeing red. We're seeing those students who our only answer is suspension, expulsion, detention. And our administrators are working around the clock with these, these students, these very high needs, these threat assessments. And so what's left are all of those students who the teacher is trying to get them back on track, and they are not getting back on track. Their behavioral needs are interrupting the classroom. Their behavioral needs are, are causing disruptions, causing an extra burden on the teachers. And we can't punish our way out of this situation. And so we needed help. And so for that, we asked for an intervention for those students that we call orange. They're not to be suspended, but they need to be addressed. And so in the traditional model, 
We give the teacher the responsibility of teaching the state standards. We give the teacher the additional responsibility of handling academic deficits. I mentor two students, eighth graders. These eighth graders are leading the way in, their, in the discipline issues that they have at their particular middle school. We went to buy these young men books to read to encourage them, and we found out that they average a first grade, second month reading level. They're seven years behind in literacy. That teacher has to deal with the state standards, seven years of academic reading deficit and behavior issues. This current model will not sustain. We give administrative coaching and resources to that teacher, but this model will not sustain. How do we address the school climate? We need help. And so what we're proposing in this pilot, or what we're actually doing in this pilot, is to help with the academic deficits. We're trying to give the teacher a faculty, give the teacher supports, give the teacher someone to tag in on to help a literacy tutor and a numeracy tutor, and you saw some of those things brought to us by uh, Chief of Academics and Administration, Anna Miller, with the, the tutors. And I wanna thank you for your support and endorsement of our expectation coaches to help with the behavioral issues. The behavioral uh, uh, issues uh, cannot fester, cannot go unaddressed, uh, but we're doing that with expectation coaches who handle the students in the orange. They do three things, and I wanna thank Dr. Turner uh, and, uh, for, for onboarding our, our expectation coaches with three very specific job descriptions, to build positive relationships with students, to know their name and their, and their, uh, their story, to support the administration and teachers and staff. They visit classrooms every day just to knock on the door and check on how that teacher's doing. And the most important thing, they connect with families. Uh, they know those students, um, those students' families, grandmothers, grandpas, uncles, aunties, whoever the guardian is. It's with a program like this and a model like that, uh, that I believe will allow us to have more hands on those students, to have more eyes and more resources for these students. Uh, when we looked at uh, 55, and I wanna thank uh, uh, Mr. Giuliano, he looked at 55 of the most offending uh, students at Irmo High School, the top 55 most offending students at Irmo High School. He found out that the average reading level of that group was sixth grade, eighth month. So we have a lot of challenges that are coming into our school, both from the requirement to teach academic standards, the academic deficits, and the behavioral issues. What could help us is if our community took the goal of creating a community climate in which students learn uh, how to deal with trauma, how to deal with loss, how to deal with disagreement, how to deal with their frustrations, how to deal with differences um, in a kinder way, in a way that we've all said we would do in a way of love. And so we're excited about this pilot. We have extended the pilot to uh, Crossroads Intermediate. And so uh, after the winter break, we will uh, be looking forward to bringing that new expectation coach on, which will make six in the Irmo area, three at Irmo High School, two at Irmo Middle School, and one at uh, Crossroads. We know when we presented this uh, pilot to our principals, they all raised their hand and said, where's our next one? So um, I, I could, could see that in a, a future budget request, we would like to take the data from this to see how many students we went from red to orange to green, uh, to yellow to green, and use that as a way to justify an expectation coach at all, at all schools. I'm very confident that we can create an environment where students feel that they can come to a safe in-person learning environment 
that I don't think we would ever eradicate bullying, but what we can do is make sure that every student feels empowered when they are experiencing that to be able to stop it. And so uh, with that, we're excited. Uh, we look forward to uh, the data and, uh, and providing uh, that first goal in our strategic plan of, uh, of a positive school climate. And to that end, uh, we're excited about a lot of, uh, of these initiatives, mainly uh, the, the one that you all have uh, graciously supported, which is our first jobs initiative. Mm -hmm. We will have at Irmo High School inviting 53 students uh, that will uh, uh, have a special invitation and that'll be this Thursday, December 16, 2021, at during their lunch hour, Mr. Beatonbo is catering. All of the chiefs will have uh, students assigned to them because they get to work for them. They get to work as students and employees. And so um, uh, many of you, uh, some of you have asked if you could attend this. We would love for you to, to be there uh, as we watch these students, um, as we recruit our students to become our employees. Uh, we, were, we are very excited about this opportunity, and I appreciate the time to take uh, just to uh, address some of the concerns that we've been hearing about safety in schools, threat assessments, bullying, and what the district is doing and trying to do. But remember, when we say we, we are schools and community. And I would like to see um, in all of our forms, whether online or live, uh, that we love and we grow our students. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, that concludes the superintendent's report. Dr. Ross, I am really excited. We've heard from a lot of teachers and I know it's my profession and I know every board member sitting here is very receptive to teachers that let them know how many more responsibilities are put on them. And COVID just exasperated it, but it, but it was there before COVID. And I just feel like this, this idea of a teacher having a faculty, I mean, I, I just, I mean, in their two facets, because that teachers, as you just said, is, is making up academic deficits and moving those that are ready to go and learning, they gotta keep moving up. And then the teacher has to deal with the discipline. So I don't know, but what this isn't the most exciting program. I feel like teachers are being heard. And I, I wanna ask you this, right here in public, I think a lot of teachers feel they can't really communicate to their principal because it's like they feel like they're complaining and that it may be taken wrong or they can't go to, you know, they, they, who can I really talk to? So they call board members and talk about, you know, what's happening in a room. And I told Dr. Ross said with this, this expectations coach, he's gonna be sure, and I know Ms. Miller's gonna be sure, that they know that teacher has a place and a person to go to, and it isn't complaining. It's working together to fix it so that teachers have a voice in, in, in that classroom needs because they really don't want to complain. They don't want to make the principal think that it's not a good school just because they're having this problem. So, I mean, I, I could go on, but, and I need to be quiet. So, but I know other people have something to say. But thank you. I know as a teacher in the classroom, this can make a difference. Amen. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lovis. We met the other day with a group of, from one of our universities here in the state. And uh, one of the things that we garnered out of that and was very Im important to the entire group, um, I call it job enrichment. but this group of professionals that you're talking about to handle the situation is going to bring, I know you're big on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I've seen that in, you know, so self-actualization is, is one of, is the top level of that. But, um, you know, I, I just believe that when you put the group together, that's, that's going to expand the skills of, especially of the primary leader, because they're going to have to become a leader of not only school children, but also adults in order to affect the situation and bring the most positive result. So this is something that, that you know, we, we talked about three years ago, and I'm glad to see, I'm glad to see that you are bringing that to to actualization.
You ready? Yes, ma'am. I just have a quick question. Um, you mentioned um, when it came to the tracking aspect so we could see how successful. What does that look like? Do you have an idea yet? Great, great question, Ms. Moore. Um, one of the things, and I, I want to shout out, or and we may need to have a special invitation, Ms. Linda uh, Johnson. And she is the expectation coach at H.E. Corley Elementary School. Uh, when we modeled this, we modeled after work that she and, and, and those like her have been doing. Now, they already received training in our terms of our expectation coaches at the elementary schools uh, from Kelly Brown and um, um, Lucy Bailey, correct? So they received that. It's her tracking system of coding. And so we're going to formalize that, that tracking system. We're on our second meeting with them uh, now, and, and uh, they will continue that training under Dr. Harris's office. Uh, but the, the notion is, um, just like we've created with the COVID, each area will have its, its, um, its, its level of behaviors that represents that color. And so we can move students up and down. And I think one of the things when we talked about this at one of the middle schools, teachers were like, whoa, you're gonna be scared of how many numbers you get in orange. But that, that means that we know, and now we have a resource to go in and address it. So the pilot will give us that first run to say, okay, this is what orange truly is. This is what yellow truly is. And that way when we uh, go across the, the, the district, we would already have some data concrete and we've, we've learned what works and what, what does not work on those different levels. Just a follow-up question. So what will a school need to prove or show you or the district from a standpoint if they need these expectation coaches? So a uh, great question. We have, uh, and I want to uh, thank our, our, our directors. Um, we had Tina McCaskill kind of poll all the elementary uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. And before I could get Dr. Willeman to poll the secondary, I think they all called Dr. Harris and said they wanted an expectation coach. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of we lobbying fund. you we, right now. We got to fund it. We got to fund it. <laughs> So our, our goal is to, uh, we believe that we can get in the budget where every school will have at least one. Title I schools would have two. Good. Any other questions? Oh, thank you.